Michelle Marie McGrath. Hello and welcome to Unclassified Woman. Now today I've got something a little bit different. I'm talking to Melanie Holmes, who is a mother of three. She has two adult sons and a teenage daughter. Melanie's lived the assumptions that marriage and babies are the path to happiness for all women. She's witnessed firsthand the pain of women who are viewed as dysfunctional or selfish because they decided to pursue something other than motherhood. She has also viewed women who've pursued motherhood despite extremely challenging circumstances without the necessary support for mother and child. With her daughter as her inspiration, as well as many women whom she interviewed... Melanie's written a book examining the cultural assumptions of motherhood and how these assumptions impact women's view of their own lives. Melanie graduated with her Bachelor of Arts in 2011, a goal that took her 20 years to attain as she paused along the way to raise her children. Age 51, Melanie embarked upon her lifelong dream of becoming a writer. Her book, The Female Assumption, was published in October 2014 and she earned a Global Media Award from the Population Institute in Washington. Her book won Best Book of 2014. You can find Melanie at melaniehomesauthor.com and I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating book and it's got some really interesting statistics that are a real eye-opener. So whether you're a mother or not, I really recommend you read this book and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. So enjoy. Oh, hi everybody. And I'm so thrilled to have Melanie Holmes here today. And Melanie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michelle. And um, as as you know, Melanie, the podcast is about inspiring and uplifting women for whom having biological children is more than likely not going to be a part of their future. So it could be circumstantial, their personal choice not to have children or, you know, a combination of chance and all sorts of other things. I'm realizing that it never seems to be straightforward. Um, And so I know that the thing I find really fascinating with your work and your perspective, Melanie, is that you're a mother of three and you've researched this subject and you've written your book, which is great, um, The Female Assumption, A Mother's View, Freeing Women from the View that Motherhood is a Mandate. I love that. What a great title. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I I, I love the title of your your podcast here, your website, Unclassified Women. I think it's very, very uh, very good title, and I'm happy to be a part of this today. Oh, thank you. And Melanie, the first thing that jumped out at me when I was reading your book is the fact that it was dedicated to your daughter. Um, was your relationship with your daughter a driving factor in writing the book? Well, actually, she was a preteen at the time, so I'd have to say it was more about my future relationship with my daughter that I was most concerned with. And I wanted to find a way to educate her about the female experience and to know that she has options and that there will be pressures from various sources as she grows older. And what that, and that I wanted her to know that one of those sources of pressure will never be me. Amazing. So obviously your perspective is flavored by your experience of motherhood as well. And so what were some of the questions that you explored on this topic before you had children? Were you sort of always very clear that you were going to have them or you weren't sure or how did that sort of evolve for you? Well, I would say (laughs) I'm a child of the 60s. So at that time, uh, you know, I'm going to refer to a little bit of research. The In the U.S., the Census Bureau said that 45% in 1960 of American households was consisted of married couples with children. And that did drop by the 21st century to um, 23%. But as a child of the 1960s, I cannot remember being aware of a single, not one single strong female role model wow. of a woman of a woman without marriage and babies. So I, 
I didn't hear the the voice of uh, Gloria Steinem, you know, the the great activist for women's yeah. rights. Um, so, you know, I was raised Catholic, and when you get married in the church, you stand before your family and friends, and you promise to accept children into your marriage. So, you know, I do. I had all those beliefs, you know, to to contend with, and then. I remember saying something to my mom about having kids someday. And I vividly remember her response. And it was, oh, yeah. (laughs) So, and there it was. There was no discussion uh, about my options or the heavy lifting of motherhood. Um, And my mom could have said a whole lot about her sacrifices. Uh, She had five, I'm the youngest of five kids. Mm. Um. She had it very hard. I, I won't go into detail there, um, but she was at home with five ki- <clears throat> five kids, and I was sort of the oops, if you will, that came along just as she was ready to go back to work. She'd been at home for 12 years taking care of the older four, and when I came along, she had to stay home for two more years because back then um, mothers couldn't work or they often didn't work. Uh, so she was, she was at home for two more years after I was born. So, you know, when I, when I write in my chapter called rewriting the scripts, I talk about a young female who talk, exclaims to her mom that she wants to be a mother someday. And instead of the mother saying, you know, I hope, oh yes, I know you'll make such a great mommy someday. I provide a script that neither reinforces nor discourages motherhood it's more along the lines of, I love being your mom, whatever you choose for your life, I'll be happy. And then taking that opportunity to open the, f- the female's mind, you know, the daughter's mind and say, you know, there was a day in women's history when women weren't allowed to vote and talking about strong, fe- you know, female role models. I didn't hear those stories and I wish I had. And I wanted to be sure that my daughter heard them. Yeah, it's so um, it's so true, and I think particularly I was brought up a Catholic as well. And again, the same thing, just this assumption that we have of you know when you grow up, when you meet a mi- nice man, when you have children, it's very much when and not if. Exactly. So of course, the majority of us just grow up expecting that that is going to be the trajectory of our lives, whether or not you know, that might be the right thing for us or whether it's even what we want. And I think much of the time, many women don't even question this. Um, you know, so it's so great that you had that awareness to provide that and, you know, really had your daughter in mind so that she knows that she's got those other options and she's got that support. So yeah. hopefully, you know, it'd be great to see much more of this moving forward. Definitely. That, that's where the conversation needs to go yeah. is, is definitely making amplifying the voices of women everywhere. And of course, bringing us together around this topic, because there are nieces, there are friends, there are coworkers, there are daughters, there are sisters. I mean, we're, you know, we're all women. So I don't, I'd, I'd love to see it as more of a womanhood conversation. Yeah. And just the fact that you know, womanhood and motherhood, the lines are very blurred there. And, you know, we need to sort of really establish the fact that motherhood and womanhood, yes, you know, can be strongly interlinked. However, you know, womanhood does not equal motherhood for every person. Absolutely. And so, Even though, you know, like you said, you never really had that conversation with your mom. She just said, yep, like it was just assumed that that's what would happen. Did you Mm -hmm. feel any other pressures from like your friends or peer groups? You know, like were you all kind of having children around the same time? And so, again, just this assumption that that was just what you would do. I... It was an assumption. It was definitely an assumption. There, I don't remember any pressures per se as far as uh, family uh, and friends. It was just something that I was just skipping along in life. Yeah, that's what the next uh, step was to do. And 
you know, I, I did get married young. And so, uh, you know, in the vein of Socrates, you know, the unexamined life, when you examine your life, hopefully you have personal growth. So I really broke down my experiences and what led me to motherhood at such a young age. I was almost 22. And so, you know, I went through, a, I had two children and then I went through a divorce and found myself just um, without any time. Uh, you know, we all live busy lives and uh, there was no helicopter mom going on. There was, I was not hovering. I was just trying to survive. Um, and I happened to fall in love with a man without a biological child of his own. And, uh, we ended up getting married, but he knew that I didn't want to have children anymore children yeah. because my energy was at zero, you know, as far as spare energy. So he accepted that and we, uh, got married in, with that personal, very personal um, agreement. There was a comment at the bridal shower from my mother-in-law, who is actually now passed away six years, and I, I miss her dearly. She did say, you know, that, well, you'll have to have at least, you know, you guys will have to have at least one. So she didn't, she didn't know. And so after my husband told her, she never said another word. But um, time went by. And we weren't talking about it. It wasn't something we felt like we needed to stand up and shout to everyone. Yeah. And we, and we were at um, a family function, and it was my husband's side. And there was a person who, whether she, the person knew or not about the personal uh, decision that we had, it was there was a very rude question among a room full of people directed at me of when are you ever going to have a kid? And I, if I'd had any, if I was close to that person or if there was any trust there, I would have said something else, but that was not there. And so I just reacted very defensively and said, I got to, how about you? And so I don't know how women without children put up with that kind of questioning yeah. Day, after day, day after day and year after year, I still see the, to this day when I think about that rude kind of intrusive questioning in, up in a room full of people. Yeah, and it's everybody's got an opinion on it. And it's quite incredible how total strangers feel that they are completely within their rights to ask it. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, I've experienced it many times and I've heard countless stories and yeah, it's just what it's it's quite yeah, it's quite astonishing how people feel fine with these very personal questions, but you know, you'd never say, "Well, how much do you earn?" You know, right. which Jody Day who, you know, she said it's it's sort of we commented on how, you know, that's another very personal question, but that's something that you wouldn't ask, but it's equally on a par <laughs> with something that's quite a private thing. It really is. And I've heard people call it a bedroom topic. And I have to agree with that. I have to agree. I know that it's a, it's in the past been, you know, small talk, con you know, a point of conversation, just what, you know, how's the weather? How you doing? Do you have any kids? And but the world has changed and I think we have to catch up in our conversations and realize that um, women aren't making the uh, living the lives that they lived 30, 40 years ago, just a couple of decades ago. Everything has changed drastically and our conversations really need to catch up. And I, I think it's really about consciousness uh, raising, yeah. you know, really. So... Yeah, and it's like, it's not small talk, is it? It's actually big talk. It's a big conversation. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that you're saying it's around consciousness because I really feel that we don't, yeah, have adequate language yet to describe many of the terms childless, child-free, all that are very unsatisfactory and they don't adequately describe it, I feel. Um, it, it's very limiting because... 
I always have this feeling like if you use the word child free, which I prefer to childless, it kind of sounds like you're skipping through the fields ecstatic, you know, on this blissful kind of cloud and then childless. Well, nobody wants to be called childless because, you know, you're not less of a woman if you don't have a child. But I know that often that term is used for people who, where it's not been a choice and they would have liked that, to have that experience. But, you know, for many reasons, it's just not been able to be their reality. So, I'm hoping that as t- as we move forward and as we evolve, we will, yeah, sort of, if, as our consciousness evolves, we'll find words to explain and describe this. I mean, even just talking about it now, I, I can hear myself rambling. I, I find it really hard to put into words. Well, I mean, I Googled the antonym for mother and it was father. I mean, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I thought, okay, let me just see what you know, Wikipedia or whatever dictionary.com has to say, what's the opposite of mother? Father? Really? (laughs) That was very insufficient. But, you know, what you're saying about child-free and childless, I absolutely write about that. And I've heard that from people. And I have friends who are mothers who um, don't understand uh, the semantics of it. And I try to explain it this way. Okay, so if, say, you're... uh, your mother is Polish and your father is African-American. How do you choose to self-identify? Aren't you able to say what you feel comfortable with? So if a woman feels more comfortable saying child-free, then don't hold that against her. She gets to self-define. If And I exactly what you just said, many women feel ch- that child-free expresses their description of their life. And so Why do we take offense with that? Why would someone say, oh, isn't that nice that you're free to go and do this and that? None of us are free to just go do this and that. I mean, there is in America the top 1% of of people making, you know, at that income level that maybe they can go and do what they, but most of us are working very hard in our jobs and with our family and, and nurturing our relationships, you know, with friends and family and I just, I don't, I don't think anyone should take exception to how someone self-identifies. Yeah, yeah, such an interesting topic that. And how can we, like, obviously these descriptions and word, like we're saying, it just doesn't really capture it and it just doesn't adequately describe it at all. And even with the message that the majority of women still hear today is that, you know, motherhood is integral to a a well-rounded life, even despite, you know, as you say in your book, despite all the advances for women in the last few decades, we still, as a society, assume that motherhood is the ultimate goal for women. Um, Why do we, why do you believe that it's still the case today that we've still got this, you know, so such a a gap really in trying to our language and our society in catching up with the changes that are taking place like why is there such a disparity it's it's like a real it's really out of alignment isn't it if you think that the number of women age 40 and over you know that don't have children has doubled in the last 10 years but like, why are these women not represented or, or visible? Why is it still the case that we're still hearing this same old message that, you know, being a mother should be central to your life? Otherwise, what's wrong with you? Well, I, I know exactly what you're saying. And it's, I, I describe it as the vanishing voices of women. It's how our voices and our accomplishments get looked over. And that's a very big part of women's history. I do think that part of the equation and what you're talking about is that women continue to be viewed as nurturing and naturally predisposed to care for children. Now, not only are there many ways for a woman to express this nurturing side of her personality, but society fails to accept that men are incredibly nurturing as well. Yeah. So in in just 10 years in the U.S., the number of fathers who forego a paycheck to care for their children has doubled from just uh, 2001 to 2011. Now, 
the numbers are 1.6 doubling the 3.4%. But still, my husband and I uh, take turns complaining about uh, commercials on TV and how they do, they show men as clueless about parenting and household chores and the multitude of commercials that show the little woman cleaning up and caring for the kids. So I really think that media plays a big part. I remember almost doing a cartwheel the first time I saw a commercial where a dad was chasing around his daughter to get her favorite little costume dress to give it its weekly washing. I mean, I seriously almost did a cartwheel. What media needs to show is that men know how to nurture and they sure do know how to cook and clean. Absolutely. My My two sons know how, my husband knows how, but you don't, Many people don't aspire to be what they can't see or they don't see. So when media influences our visions of ourselves, then then this is what we we just keep the status quo. It's so true that. And you've just reminded me of the film, you know, Misrepresentation, Mm -hmm. where in that film they talk about the need for young women to have role models, strong female leadership in public roles that they can see so that they can aspire to grow into those roles or you know to if they want to do something publicly whether it's in politics or something else but all they all that we do see in the media is that when women are in these roles they're you know constantly criticized for usually what they look like um regardless of whether they're any good at the job or not, that gets completely overshadowed by the personal criticism of having to look a certain way and all of this outdated, you know, over-sexualized nonsense. So it's so true, that thing of, you know, you can't be what you can't see. It's so relevant. Right. And I'm really glad you brought up politics because I have a point related to that. And In 2008, and we're still talking about it, Hillary Clinton, who's running for president now, she shed a tear in public and the media had a field day. And when her daughter was pregnant, she was asked if becoming a mother, a grandmother would influence her decision to run for president. Really? Oh my goodness. When has a man ever been asked questions like this? There are so many double standards that get in the way of women's progress and the evolution of how we see ourselves and each other. Yeah. And that really, that really is an important point. That's how, how do we see each other as women? There's so much judgment. And at times when women need to rally around, you know, when in the past, when we needed to rally around and fight for the vote or in the U.S., the Equal Pay Amendment as a uh, in the 1964 or access to higher education or certain career tracks we rallied around and we came together and we made progress but it seems like we need a big cause in order to come together and it's this everyday stuff where we could choose to connect but we have to choose to do that so you know we as women we know how many pressures we face We know the discrimination. We know how hard it is to choose a path in life Mm. that someone might not expect. We know street harassment. We know rape. Let's stick together. Let's stand as sisters and stop passing judgment and flinging around adjectives like selfish and dysfunctional. Yeah, it's so unhelpful, isn't it? It it really, you know, continues to reinforce this, well, myth of separation in a way. And so... Obviously, much of this would influence, of course, what you want to communicate to your own daughter. And so, like you were talking about how you already had two children, and I'm assuming then obviously your daughter was your third child. So how did that come about, and what was the process that you went through then um, with her? Right. So that's a really... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's time went by and uh, what was unbeknownst to the people around us where we had said, you know, we're not going to have one unbeknownst to everyone else. Every six months I would bring up the topic with my husband and every single time I would cry and every single time he would say, all I need is you to be happy. 
But somewhere inside of me, I had this feeling like I was failing and I, and I, I can't put my finger on it, but I, I did have, my husband lost his dad when he was 17. And I think it was my, my wish for him to experience, experience biological fatherhood. Yeah. And, and it did have, uh, I think it really, the pivotal moment was, um, an opportunity came up where I was working to reduce my work hours and, drastically. And so I was 33 years old, looking at 30, staring at 34. And to me, I just thought, you know, it's, it's now or never, you know, the, my sons were, uh, there, there's a 10, 10 and 11 year old, uh, sorry, 10 and 11 year gap between them and their, their little sister. So I just didn't want to, it was either now or never. So it was that it was a combination of things. It was having the opportunity to have some energy freed up so that I could actually feel like I could, wouldn't shortchange a child. And then there was just this feeling of wanting my husband to experience the biological fatherhood that, you know, he lost his dad very young. Mm. And, but I, I have to say, I mean, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that there were expectations that were swirling around me that I felt somehow that I was, you know, not doing something that I probably should be considering. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so how were your family with that? Did you feel pressure from them? Uh, no, no, it was only really just that one instance where I was, <laughs> you know, uh, public, publicly outed for yeah. what are you waiting for? You know, that kind of thing. And so I, I, that definitely felt like pressure. That definitely felt like, um, you know, I was not living up to my side of the agreement, you know, of marriage. And, um, that's, that probably played a part, although it still makes me angry. I think it was those wondering what people were thinking, even though no one on his side of the family was saying anything. Yeah. So, Sometimes we, we, we read into, you know, what other people are thinking. And I, you know, again, this was 18 years ago, so we've come a long way in a couple of decades, but it is one of those things that I wanted my daughter to understand. Cause of course she was going to grow up and hear the story of, well, your mom and dad never were going to have, get, you know, they yeah. were never going to have, well, then here you are. So I really sort of wanted her to understand that too. And, and so this reminds me of what you say in some of your research, which is fascinating that in some of the, you know, some of the studies that you looked at with mothers of daughters across the US, that 88% said they would assume their daughters will become mothers one day, 88%. And then 42% indicated they would be disappointed if their daughters opted out of motherhood and, you know, would probably try to persuade them otherwise. So, I mean, they they are such interesting statistics. Um, why do you believe that people are so quick to say, you know, well, why not? When really we should probably be asking, well, why do you want a child? What are your reasons for that rather than the other way around? Well, you know, I, I, asked, I asked only a few questions because, you know, you don't want to do one of those long polls when you're, when you're I, I reached 200 women with and without children. So across the United States. Um, so I asked only a few questions, but I thought that it was pivotal questions. Do you assume, would you be disappointed? And if you heard ambivalence or disinterest, would you say something? And so that 42%, I don't want to get into mother blaming here, yeah, but, yeah. You know, but it, it, but it is one of those aspects. It's kind of a, it's emotion. It's emotionally charged. You know, mothers love their children. Therefore, they think that they're going to want to do the same thing. Um, it's, it's a lot of emotion. Uh, so, but I do say that in my book, I absolutely agree with you that if we're going to ask women without kids, why not, then we should ask females who express a desire for motherhood, why do you want them? And I think the reason this question isn't asked 
is it's the assumption that all females are going to want kids at some point. I mean, I, I, I have plenty of interviews that are in the book and, and one of them is a woman who, uh, was in college and had just always assumed that was going to be her track in life. And then she met a teacher who didn't have children and that teacher became a mentor. And it was the first time that this woman considered that, Oh, you mean I don't have to do this thing? Oh, that's, that's interesting. And so she is happily child free. She lives with a man who's happily child free and, um, they, you know, but she had never considered it before. So yeah, it's, it, you know, and she, so that 42%, they would say things such as, you know, motherhood brings more meaning to your life. Uh, the mother child bond, that's the truest form of love. Yeah. Um, and oh, by the way, P.S., I want a grandchild. <laughs> that, that was another one of my interviews where this young woman who wanted her passion is inner city youth. And she's a teacher and she wants to teach. She wants to be the best teacher for underprivileged kids because there are statistics that inner city schools don't get the best teachers. So this is her passion. And when she did soul searching in her 20s, she decided she doesn't want to have her own kids. She wants, this is her passion. She wants to throw all her energy into it. And her mom got mad at her. And, you know, there were, you know, not actual arguments, but words exchanged and then, you know, glares and the, well, I guess it's going to have to be one of your siblings that gives me a grandchild. And so we don't want that. We, we shouldn't be telling our our daughters that, you know, or even telling our nieces or, or sisters or friends that, Hey, this is, you know, you're going to regret it someday. You're going to grow old and lonely. I just, yeah, those are some of the things, those are a lot of the things that I heard from. Yeah, that yeah, I think that's a lot of the stereotypes that are trotted out, aren't they? Especially in relation to, <clears throat> well, you'll regret it. Like, well, you don't know that at all. And from some of the the studies that I've read, it seems to be that when people have looked at that and future regret, the majority of people haven't regretted it at all. So I guess it's to do with whether or not somebody is already living a meaningful life on their own terms or not. I totally understand that people can find meaning through having children. I get that. But I also sometimes feel that people are also looking you know, to motherhood as, yeah, as the sort of experience of meaning in their life, if they're not necessarily currently experiencing that already. Right. Well, it's, life doesn't give you fairy tales. I mean, for, for any of us, I think we can agree that that's a, a true statement. So yeah. I think that we have to not talk about, okay, so we tend to revere motherhood. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We love our mothers. I mean, you know, and it's, it's not a bad thing, but when we start talking about motherhood as the panacea for, you know, all that's wrong with your life, then, then it gets a little tenuous, a little precarious. And so, um, yeah, I just think I just, you want to make sure that you love yourself and that you're not, trying to fix something about your life by having a child. I mean, some people will have a child to keep their marriage together. Some people will have a child because of, uh, because they think that they're going to take care of them in, in old age. And, you know, I, I was on a, a, one of those comments in, in an article, uh, an article the other day and someone said something about, well, at least I know I won't have to pay someone to take care of me when I'm old. Well, um, <laughs> they don't know mom, that at all. My mom is 85, Michelle, and my one of my brothers passed away 10 years ago. One is disabled. Uh, one of my siblings lives out of state. That leaves two of us, and I live an hour away. So guess what? My mom pays for care. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not practical. I mean, even if you've got a brilliant relationship with your mother – 
um, you know, it doesn't mean that when they, they are in their old age and in need of care that you're only going to be living five minutes away. I mean, I'm living on the opposite side of the world to my mom. And we're increasingly mobile now as a society. So, again, this whole thing that you're just going to be looked after by your children in your old age is absolutely ridiculous. It's it's not to be assumed. It's definitely not to be assumed. And so many people – so getting back to those reasons for having children, when you're looking for uh, someone to take care of you in old age or, or to spend time with you so you're not old and lonely, oh, man, come on. I mean, my, one of my sons is in the military. I, I haven't seen him in uh, one year and eight months. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, the time goes by and you just don't, uh, you know, if they like you, if they don't live close, you don't put your future into your kid, like expecting your kids to entertain you and, and always having time for you. I mean, that's that's not shouldn't be the expectation. That's that'd be nice if if the, the families lived close physically and had time to get together. But often that's not the reality. No, and it's just not the role of every woman to be a mother, even if it's their biological ability and there's no problem in that way. We've got we've all got different gifts and abilities and interests and you know I believe that we've all got a unique path and it's really up to us to determine what is meaningful for you know each one of us so one of the things I remembered reading that you wrote was about making sure that you have a suitable support structure for a child in place if you can and it seems that there's not always enough consideration given to this which is is a really important point and also it's Obviously, it's a huge financial burden. Right. So I do write about uh, what I call the parenting partnership. And I refer to the expenditure of the big three, one of which is money. Uh, The other two are time and energy. And it really is the rare person who goes into it all alone through 18 plus years of raising a child. So the partnership doesn't have to be husband, wife, mom, and dad. Um, it can be other variations. So there's data from the fragile families and child well-being study uh, that points to stability as more important than structure. So perhaps the parenting partnership consists of grandparents or aunts and uncles who live nearby and are willing to be a part of that partnership. Or perhaps the parenting partnership consists of same-sex couples. We have now legalized that in the United States. But according to um, research at the Boston University School of Medicine, three decades of research shows that the idea uh, supports the idea that gay parents produce happy, well-adjusted kids. So as far as whether every woman should be a mother, you know, we all have heard horror stories, right? I mean, yeah. we all heard the bad stories. I list the six categories of maternal narcissism in one of my chapters. And, you know, Oprah Winfrey was asked one time, uh, probably many times, why she never became a mother. And her answer at one time was uh, that she wasn't parented well. And so I think this kind of brutal honesty and self-discovery Discovery should be respected and honoured. Absolutely. And she's a great example of somebody that uses her nurturing and caring qualities in, in a much broader sense. And she's impacting so many people rather than, you know, maybe having had a couple of children. Right. And, and, and yet I heard the comment from someone that, oh, she's done all these great things, but isn't it a shame she doesn't have anyone to leave her legacy to? And, and, and that, that idea of legacy, just that gets all tangled up in, in this as well. So, yeah, I mean, we all can leave a legacy in a, a million different ways. It's only, you know, not just genetically. Absolutely. And so another one of your quotes that I really enjoyed was, you know, motherhood should not be treated as something to check off the to-do list. Women are complete beings. Amen. 
Amen. (laughs) Exactly. And so, you know, that is the truth. So how can we remind each other of this and support all women, whatever their life choices are and circumstances? What is it we need to do to, you know, we need to really close that gap, don't we? Right. So I really think it comes down to respecting each other's boundaries and accepting that we live in a diverse world and we may not want the same things and that's okay. So women are complete beings and I don't think that we should think of it. uh, I don't think that we should assume that someone wants what we want or that they think like we think because more times than not, we're going to be proved wrong. We can assume that someone agrees with us and they say, oh, no, no, actually, I, I don't I don't really think that way. So woman, or motherhood and womanhood is just another one of those diversity topics. You know, do we want women to feel accepted or do we want them to feel maligned? I mean, setting boundaries and respecting each other's boundaries and staying in our own business and not saying, well, why doesn't Susie or Sally do A, B, or C? That's disrespectful. And that's crossing over into their boundaries and their business. So when we stay inside of our own business, we really do a lot uh, of we're respecting that person. Absolutely. And so, Melanie, as we're sort of coming to a close, I'd love to hear who are the women that you find inspiring? Well, thank you for asking that question because I gave that some thought. Uh, There are so many women who inspire me. Each of the women who endorsed my book, uh, those with and without kids, including Jodi Day, Lisa Haysha, who's a life coach, Lisa Hymas, who is a co-founder of a environmental news site and Dr. Julianne Malveaux, who is out of Washington, DC and works for uh, African-American economic education. So I also have a personal mentor and she was one of my professors, Dr. Pat O'Brien. And she taught me so much about women's history and how our expectations and or assumptions really impact how women feel about their choices and their Mm -hmm. futures. But I would say most of all, perhaps, is Madeline Kane, who wrote The Childless Revolution in 2001. And she interviewed women without children through circumstance and biology and choice. And it was a quote in her book spoken by someone she called Donna. I don't know if that was the right name. uh, Donna said, I thought if I couldn't have a child, there was no reason to live. And that pushed me to envision my own daughter saying those words someday if she wanted motherhood but couldn't achieve it. And Madeline wrote the foreword of my book. And even though uh, I also interviewed women without children, I believe her book was seminal because it pried open Pandora's box as the 21st century was dawning. It was published in 2001. And women as unclassified is a topic that society likes to ignore and belittle. And society silences women's voices that demand to be heard. And Madeline also had a teenage daughter when her book came out. And I really respect and appreciate every time I've encountered another mother who jumps onto this bandwagon. Because we're all in this together. We are all women. We should all support each other. And I really, I really found that that was Madeline's message. And she was the first mother that I found to write about the topic. So, wow. Sounds wonderful. And I am, I am aware of that book. I haven't read it yet, but I'll definitely read it now that you've sort of reminded me again. Um, But so true. So important for us all to support each other in whatever our choice and circumstances are in our life and really come together and sort of let go of this perceived gap and these labels that are really so separating for all of us. Right. And I love the way, you know, you were talking about vanishing voices 
um, that keeps sort of disappearing through time. And so what do you what do you feel is really at the core of why this is? Because is it because these women are, are seen as threatening? They're threatening the status quo. Well, I would have to say the vanishing voices. I found a woman whose plight began in my hometown, my itty bitty farm town, Midwestern farm town, hometown, who's who back in the mid 1800s, her husband committed her to an insane asylum, which husbands were able to do because back then women had no right to their property or their children. And I I say white women because, of course, we know in U.S. history at that time, black women were property. But women have been, their voices have vanished because they've been thought of as feeble-minded, emotional. Uh, Their accomplishments have been brushed aside. I mean, we have Women's History Month in March. And so you know that when you have a whole month set aside for the accomplishments of women, you know that that group of women have been uh, pushed aside. So Elizabeth Packard, her plight began in my hometown. And here I was researching my book and I found this woman who came after she got out of the insane asylum, which took three whole years, her husband had was gone with her property and her children and she had no recourse. So she spent the rest of her life and the rest of her money and everything uh, campaigning for the rights for women for their property, as well as requiring something more than a husband's word to commit a woman to a, a mental institution. And we have the Packard laws. So, you know, vanishing voices, I really think more than anything, it's, it's, a, there's something about this weaker sex, this, uh, viewing women as less capable, more emotional, you know, that our hormones affect our decision-making and, yeah. you know, it, I, I think that's, that's what that's about. And that's women can be so strong, such strong leaders. And in the United States, we have 19 states that have never sent a woman to the Senate. It's 2015, really. (laughs) So I really think we need more women in power, you know, more, more women in leadership. And I think we'll, we'll make more inroads if we have that, but gosh, it takes so long, but you know, the, the women, the civil rights or women's rights movements in the United States, you know, the first one was with voting in, in, in the early 20th century. The second movement was, you know, with the Equal Pay Amendment. And uh, then the third wave was for LGBTQ women in the 1970s. But so all that all that's not that long ago. And, yeah. and we yeah. want progress faster but we just have to keep working at it. We have to keep working together and and really trying to understand and raise consciousness, you know? Mm. And just having so many more of these conversations that are open and inclusive and just removing, removing these taboos and stereotypes. Well, I am actually one of the invited speakers at the first ever – it's called Not Mom Summit. Uh, yes, it's run- in October in Cleveland, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Karen Malone Wright, yeah. uh, run- mom.com, and her team have put together this summit where women without children will come together and talk about these issues and what do you say and how do you deal with these pressures and some of it, I don't, I don't, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but um, I will be one of the keynotes no it's great I had a chat to Karen last week and I mean it's amazing I think it's it's fantastic that it's the first conference of this type in the world and hopefully the first of many more I feel right there needs to be more and so hopefully that will catch more attention and there's more books coming out and so as women just keep demanding to be heard I think this time hopefully it'll stick I mean Stephanie Mills in 1969 delivered her college commencement address and said 
She's an ecologist. And she said, I'm sad to say the best thing I can do for the earth is to not have children. Fast forward to the 21st century and you have women who are saying, I'm happy to say that the best thing I can do for the earth is to not have children. So, you know, the conversations are there, whether anyone remembers that Stephanie Mills said that in 1969, but there's, there's so many women who've, who've written and worked so hard for women's uh, rights and, and progress as far as how women are viewed. And we just have to keep talking about it. Yeah. So, oh, well, thank you, Melanie. I've loved talking to you about this. Thank you so much for your time and valuable work. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak. You are so welcome. Thank you so much.